¿Cuánto tiempo hace que no puede leer? Es el problema que no puede ver al lado o totalmente no puede ver. ¿Cuántos años tiene usted? 56. 56. ¿De qué trabaja usted? ¿De agricultura? ¿Y puede ver lo que está haciendo? Muy poco de esto es como pudiera Tenemos una especialista de ojos que trabaja en la clínica. Podemos uh, avisar para que todos puedan venir a ver. Citizens are no way poor in spirit. However, Bolivia is the poorest nation in South America. Poverty exists throughout the country, but is most present in the underdeveloped lowland rainforest outside of Santa Cruz. is mostly dotted with small villages of four or five hundred people, such as Palacio. When you see a village like this, we're talking about essentially mud huts. They have thatched roofs and dirt floors. They don't make very much over and above what it takes to sustain them. They may have chickens that they're raising at their own house, um, or they may take in other people's laundry to do. But the employment options are pretty limited. Many men work as tenant farmers, planting crops on someone else's land. They are what we call peones. They work for these other people and they get, they get money for their work. The men go into the jungle to cut the trees. Others are hunters and they sell what they hand. It's not a job that will make people to have a better life. Families are, are just barely making it on the wages that they uh, make from this type of a thing. They're not starving, but they're not, you know, thriving either. These are hardworking people who just don't make very much and just can't seem to get much ahead. You see it in them that they've been working hard. You touch their hands and you can feel that they've been working all day. And whether it's that they're hardworking or if it's just a toll as to what, you know, where they live and the stress of life, you know, you can see that in people's faces. These are men with fatigue and strain. They're using machetes all day, so they have repetitive motion types of injuries in their arms, uh, the legs, and their back from bending over. Workers are also victim to serious skin infections, such as leishmaniasis, as well as fungal infections that can permeate the soft tissue and bone, making them extremely difficult to treat. We've seen infectious disease in the legs way into the bone because these people never went to the doctor for more than a year and in danger to lose the, the legs just because of, a, of an infection. Poor sanitation and hygiene leads to many other health problems. Villages have trouble obtaining potable water, which can lead to gastrointestinal problems and severe diarrhea in children. Children can also acquire intestinal parasites from walking barefoot. In the rural parts of Bolivia, medical care is really pretty sparse. There are not that many doctors, there are not that many resources. The people in the area, they don't have very much money either to be able to even buy medications should they need them. <laughs> if they go to one of the physicians in the area, and as I say, there aren't very many, the physicians may prescribe medications and they just can't afford to buy them. Most people don't have health insurance. We are concerned because we have, let's see, 
We have 40 million people with no health insurance. That's one-seventh of our population. Um, I think it's closer to two-thirds of the, patient, the population in Bolivia has no health insurance. Mark Malich and Susan Ho, husband and wife, founded the Daniels Hammond Patient Assistance Foundation in the 1980s to bring medical care to those in need. Dr. Ho and Dr. Douglas Viroel, a Bolivian endocrinologist, met in Chicago in 1994. It was there that they discovered they shared a kindred spirit, a spirit of wanting to bring health care to the poor of the world. The idea for the Centro Medico Humberto Parra was born. In 2001, Milton Parra, a wealthy Santa Cruz landowner, was under the care of Dr. Viroel. He was dying from lung cancer. Milton Parra passed, but before his death he told Dr. Viroel he wanted to help the Bolivian healthcare system. He donated 20 hectares of land in memory of his father, Humberto Parra. Douglas immediately calls my mom saying, we have this opportunity to do something great for Bolivian healthcare. Will you help me build a clinic? My mom says, of course we can build this clinic. Susan and Mark donated the money to build the clinic, and construction was underway near the rural village of Palacio. The voice spread out that there was a new clinic and people uh, already started coming before the clinic was finished. We bought all the furniture to furnish the clinic for $1,000 and we put it all in a truck and we drove up to the clinic. People from the town kind of appeared from everywhere, unloaded the truck, put together the furniture that needed to be assembled and then they sat down on the chairs in the waiting room waiting to be seen. So we saw some patients that day. Nisha Malhorta, Maggie McElwain, and Elisa Confi were the first American volunteers to come to the clinic. Starting in Palacio, these three women went door to door and village to village in an effort to understand the health care needs of each family. They gathered information on diet and housing and also learned about the conditions and lifestyle practices that caused certain health problems. Rebecca Locks and Simone Van Swan expanded the initial health survey, providing a fuller picture of the health care needs of the Bolivian people. no, no, eso. No, no, nunca, no. Oh. <laughs> no me creen. <laughs> Baby, yeah, no. eso, agua y <laughs> también traguito. <laughs> Yo no entiendo. Uh. Ok, señor. Estoro. Yeah, gracias. Primer beso. Primera vez la traigo. ¿Y su nombre, señor? Rubén. 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 Fecha de nacimiento. <laughs> Ahorita tiene ocho, nueve años tiene cumplido. No fuma, es no perro, fuma. no bebe, es perro. Ok, ¿alergias? No tiene. No tiene. Okay. Tiene eh, caracha nomás en la cabecita. Okay. Y uh, su perro. 
Sí, soltero. <risa> Cansado de decir. <risa> ¿Esta es su esposa, no? ¿Esta es su esposa? <risa> ok. Colorado, se puede. <risa> Un número nomás aquí. Ok. Ya está todo. Un número. ¿Hace cuánto tiempo que está esto? Picando, picando, comiendo, picando, comiendo, picando, 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 ¿Cuál es el motivo? Puede ser que haya sido un traumatismo, solamente lo que haya sí, tenido, que un absceso. Their priorities are to eat, to survive, and then comes education, health. When they are sick, they wait just too much to go and see a doctor, because they are surviving. Although doctors are not expensive in the countryside, medicines are. People have to go long ways to see doctors, and when they see the doctor, they don't have the money to buy the medicines. Often we see diseases that are common not just in Bolivia, but in the United States also, but we see them coming at very advanced stages. We have seen a lot of women with cervical cancer. This should be very easy to detect in the early stages. This is why people have pap smears every year. We see people who die of cervical cancer, and death from Cervical cancer should be 100% preventable. What we provide is not only physicians to see the patients, but also provide the medications and any of the tests that need to be done to take care of these people. Should they need surgery, and we try to take care of at least some of that, not all of that. It's really a fairly complete type of a service that we're able to provide for these people that they just can't afford. They just don't have the money to do this. La L, la T, la N. We have an ophthalmologist that comes out on weekends. We have a full dental suite. We have high-speed drills and all of the things necessary to do full dental work. We also have a gynecologist that comes out on weekends and so that we can save up uh, some patients who have gynecological problems and tell them to come back when a gynecologist comes if they're beyond our uh, abilities to deal with the circumstance. One of the things that uh, I haven't seen as much in the United States is the complications of having, uh, you know, a lot of pregnancies, many uh, children, and that's um, uterine prolapse, where the uterus actually sort of becomes so low that it's uh, sort of half of it is outside of the outside of the body. Florida Cerrone lives 20 miles outside of Palacio. She suffered from severe uterine prolapse, complicated by cancer. Her uterus was way down to the knees to the niche, and she had been living with that for the last 10 years because nobody, she didn't have money for the surgery. Nosotros te vamos a ayudar, ya le di, de entramos y ya fui yendo a, a la clínica ya, o sea, fui yendo a, a Palacio a hacerme atender. De ahí la señora María le, le, le hizo el este ya para que, para que me lo saquen la matriz. So we helped her. 
we pay that surgery and we help that lady to have a better quality of life, not having infections and everything for just $280. Me ponía feliz porque había quien me ayude. Y me ayudaron. The clinic has provided hundreds of people with life-saving surgery, often for as little as two or three hundred dollars. Ilda Sandoval was a recipient of a more expensive surgery from the clinic. She needed a pacemaker. She had reached a point where she was having fainting spells. The fainting spells were sort of periods when her heart didn't beat and she didn't get blood to her brain and she really passed out. And then it would start again. Ya parece que ya no iba a seguir viviendo porque ya los desmayos eran mucho, ya ya no no podía yo ya nada. Paraba en cama, en cama, en cama nomás, así que pero con la llegada de la doctora, la clínica, fue un alivio, fue un fue un milagro, como yo digo, ¿no? Y ya ella en persona trajo un cardiólogo. Entonces le dice que era urgente mi operación. Me dice, le vamos a hacer una cirugía del corazón, le vamos a poner un marcapaso. Entonces yo le digo, doctora, no tengo plata yo, no puedo, doctora. ¿Cuánto me han pedido eso otros médicos que en particulares, no? Que yo iba más antes a hacerme ver, pero no tengo, doctora, plata. Ella sonriente me dice, no, Hilda, yo voy a pagar. One of the things that we've been trying to do is not just come in and see people once for a problem, but to set up some system where they continue getting medical care for diseases that are chronic. Diabetes and uh, hypertension are an example of this, and we're trying to set up a care program for diabetes and hypertension that can be a model for other kinds of diseases. Two second-year medical students from Northwestern University, Lisa Jager and Sarah Medendorp, brought their care program to the communities surrounding the clinic. Sarah Mendorp and I are down here to seek out the patients that have either diabetes, hypertension, or both, and to set up support groups for them in three different procedencias and inform them as to what it means to have diabetes and what it means to have hypertension. For both diabetes and hypertension, it's a lifestyle change. And part of that lifestyle change is taking your medicine. But we have focused on three areas here. Changes in diet, changes in exercise, and taking your medications regularly. The idea is that we're going to plant this kernel in their head that it's not just about medication, it's not just about diet, it's not just about knowing that my sugar is 245. What does that mean that it's 245 and last week it was 130? <laughs> Uh, abajo de 120 es, es normal, pero esta mañana su número, su número es 98, es, es, es muy bien. We say, this is where your blood sugar is now, this is where it was two, three, four days ago. You can see that it's higher or lower, and then we discuss the implications. If it's lower, we say, that's great, you know, what have you been doing? Have you changed your diet? What have you changed? Usted piensa que es porque de cambios en su dieta? Cambios en la dieta son muy efectivos para controlar los niveles de azúcar y podemos ver aquí, okay? The clinic draws from a wide group of towns and procedencias here surrounding Palacio. The clinic has support groups in these communities. They have a group of usually women that have been organized by the clinic to mobilize the people in these communities to bring them to the clinic. The first step was to find potential leaders of these support groups. We had to teach them how to take blood pressures and how to interpret that. We also had to teach them how to take blood sugars and how to interpret that. We had to teach them how to advise patients. They came in with high blood sugars or high blood pressures and what that meant. Oh, Step two was to find all the patients in the area that have diabetes or hypertension or that even have a family history of these diseases. We're focusing our efforts in three different residences in Yapakani, in Bonavisa, and in Abilete. We are very fortunate in Yapakani because we have a nurse who works here at the clinic. Her name is Ginda, and we are based out of her house. 
Her family has a garage type of building that we're able to stock with all of our equipment. She has put some medications in there also. It's nice for Lisa and I because she already knows blood sugar. She already knows how to take a blood pressure. She already knows how to counsel patients in some of these issues. She's been very proactive in finding patients, recruiting patients, getting the word out that they have to come to her house to get this done. And also kind of saying that it's an important thing to do to have your blood sugar checked twice a week. There's usually four of us that are working. One of us will do blood pressures. One of us will take blood sugars. Usually Gene does counseling patients on how they're going to get to the clinic. She has set up a system of transportation to and from Yapakani to the clinic. One time I saw on TV this person who was throwing the starfish to the sea and this other person approached to him and asked, uh, what are you doing? And he responded, oh, I'm trying to save the life of the starfish because the tide is receding and the starfish are going to die. And the other guy said, but look at the, look at the fish. They are thousands and thousands. You're not going to be helpful. And he picked up one of the starfish, threw it to the sea, and he said, for that starfish, it's going to make the difference. Bolivia is such a poor country with so many problems because of poverty. It can make the difference, even for one person, and that's going to be good. I think for people who have more to help people who have less, there's obviously a concept that goes back forever and has been around in mankind you know, since the beginning of time. I think it's just sort of one of these moral imperatives that you just can't let people go who just aren't making it. Sometimes they need some help. For those of us who are fortunate to have a little bit more, it uh, seems like the right thing to do to help those who have a little bit less. When you, your mother said there are people starving in China, it's kind of an abstraction. You know, I think for my kids, it, uh, it's not so much of an abstraction if you say, you know, there's somebody with uh, life-threatening medical problems someplace. Their response is, whose room are they staying in? Not, isn't that too bad? Whose room are they staying in? <laughs> um, so the people that you can help are no longer kind of anything distant. Um, you know, you know their names. You know you have a way to get that money to them. It is impossible to live in a country as poor as Bolivia without having a social conscience. And it's, it's, it's impossible. We gotta help because uh, people need help. That's it. ¿Qué quieres ser cuando más mayor? Manuel, yo quiero ser este, doctora. <laughs> <laughs>